What's up, man? Uh, you know, it's chilly, chilly morning in Texas. It's uh, it's the uh, most bizarre thing that we get hundred degree weather for all these days, seemingly months, and uh, then all of a sudden it gets a little chilly, and uh, it's it's quite the shock. But uh, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying yeah, it. Yeah, no, I, I like it too. I I have way too many hoodies and jackets <laughs> in any opportunity I have to uh to wear them I'll take it yeah for sure we don't get a lot of time to wear like real winter clothes so it's yeah. nice it's nice yeah. well uh let's let's get this thing kicked off we have a lot to talk about so let's let's get into this you ready let's do it all right good news stories I have the girls for longer than normal Usually I have them like a standard every Thursday, first, third, fifth weekend of the month and their mother's traveling. So I have them for actually the next month or so, we're going to have them a lot more than we normally do, which is great because I won't be spending Thanksgiving with them. So I'll have extra time with them on, on both sides. So that's my good news. It's very good news. I'm sure your, your dad will be very happy. Is he going to see them? Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah. The parents <laughs> are, or the grandparents are always super happy when they get yeah. to see the girls. Yeah. That's awesome. So my good news story. Hmm. So I guess the good news is I have, this is the most time I've ever dedicated to the modern people leader and I'm loving it. I've had the opportunity to do things that I've wanted to do for a long time. For example, I'm sure many listeners have noticed we have a new logo and cover art um so excited to sort of you know refresh the, the by the branding. way i i love the new logo every time i see it it just is uh it's it's so satisfying so pleasing so simple and to the point it uh to so me that's the sign it. of a, a great logo yeah yeah so you know things like that and then um we now have a linkedin newsletter i i had hey. seen a couple of people start linkedin newsletters and thought we should do that. Just don't have enough time. Now I have to, now I have plenty of time. So um yeah, if if you haven't subscribed to our LinkedIn newsletter, you should. It's the same information you would get from our email newsletter, but on LinkedIn. Um so yeah, check that out. Yeah, I, I thought you were going to well, I, I don't want to jinx us nor steal steal future thunder, but I thought you were gonna mention progress we're making on potential sponsors. That's that. That's a goal of ours was to be able to uh, to bring new sponsors on, and if you guys listen regularly, you'll know that about a month, month and a half ago, maybe two months, we we formalized the Modern People Leader, created all the legal entities, and so we're making some good traction. No, no major announcements yet, but I think that uh, I think that we're gonna get we're we're gonna have some news for you all very soon. So. I'm going to say, I know that's kind of cryptic. I know, I know that's kind of cryptic. I know that's kind of cryptic, but here we are. Yeah, no, I, I'm very superstitious, so I'm not going to say anything. I'm knocking on wood, crossing my fingers, doing anything I can to not jinx. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Excellent. So, so what do you want to talk about today? I figured we could quickly just talk through the last couple of episodes we've had a, we had a couple of great guests on we had jessica zwan the coo of, of whereby and we had jim bartolomea from clickup so i thought we could quickly just go through the top takeaways from each episode and then from Excellent. there i know that there's something that you want to talk about that i think a lot of people will be interested in hearing about and that's the topic of planning for for 2023 um, everyone's so I won't, favorite topic yeah planning and budgeting <laughs> yeah so i won't steal the thunder there but um yeah i i guess i'll i'll uh i'll just ask you what you know from the jessica episode what was your was there like any one thing that that stood out to you oh man yeah with you know the the episode with jessica was just such a an eye-opening episode for me or just mind expanding i guess is a, is a better way of putting it there've been 
geez, I don't know, a handful, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of great guests and we talk about a lot of great things and I'm in no way diminishing, you know, the experiences we've had with, with every single guest, but there, there have been like a handful of guests and topics that truly change the way that I look at the people space and modern people leadership. And Jessica, the Jessica episode was definitely one of those in, in that, you know, having spent all these years in HR, I've, I've obviously, you know, seen kind of the move, the people ops movement come to fruition and, uh, you know, always been, you know, very supportive. It, you know, it sound, it's always sounded really cool. And, Mm -hmm. um, the way that just the people ops function has been repositioned over time. But for me, Jessica was able to explain this, what I believe the real movement to be, which is operating your employee experience function like it's a product of of the company. And um, and, and for me, like it just brought together so many things that, that honestly, I, I'm not sure I fully understood you know, with, with the people ops movement, but, you know, just the simplicity in how Jessica, uh, walked us, you know, how she's laid it out, I think is, uh, is really opened my mind to, to how we all should be thinking about people operations and how we could approach people ops in a way that is, is more like a product management approach. And so the meaning, the approach that you take with modern software development is very agile. It is research oriented. You're, you're bringing other people into the process of prioritization and what you're going to work on and it's iterative. So then you build the software, you deploy it, you get feedback. And the idea is that you quickly, quickly address any major, any major issues, any major gaps. And you double down on the things that are are really appealing and are really working for the end user. In this case, the end user are your employees. And so I for me, you know, I I think that is I, I know that that is a really broad <laughs> takeaway, but but that's that's where I'm at with with the Jessica episode. And I, I again, I just love the way that the the medium article that that she's put out there walks the reader through how how you can approach this and and really and it feels as though there are some requirements but any organization can really take this kind of approach yeah and i think the way that she put it she said every company is building three products at any given time the first two are what they're selling to customers and what they're selling to investors so to customers you know the example she gave a lot. Well, she didn't use this as an example as a product, but she talked about Snicker bars a lot. So, you know, it could be Snicker bars, it could be bricks, it could be widgets, you know, whatever it is that your company is selling. Then you have what you're selling to investors, which is a financial instrument. And then the last one, which we're just we were just talking about, and what the VP of people or the chief people officer is usually responsible for building is what you're selling to your employees. And she says people leaders need to start thinking about the product that they're building and selling as a subscription product because employees can choose to cancel or continue their subscription or membership whenever they want. And, you know, this is something we've talked about with Steve Cadigan um, in Gen Z, how Gen Z is just so used to this subscription economy because that's all they've ever known since they were little kids, right? Whether it's buying... uh, a video game on their phone. I feel like that's something that a lot of kids from the age of like two or three are getting used to already or buying, you know, video games for their Xbox, whatever it is. They they know that they can they can buy something and continue to buy it for a few months. And then if they get bored of it, they can cancel it. And it's the same thing with, with work. And I think that <clears throat> Jim actually in our last episode, I wish I had the quote written down, but he talked about how one of his mentors used to tell him how you need to think about what you're doing on the people team, like building commercial products. Do you remember him saying something to that effect? Yeah. yeah, And I I didn't, I I didn't notice that thread until I was editing his episode the other night, but yeah, I know it feels like a lot of people are sort of circling around the same idea that you need to think of what you're selling to your employees as a product. So yeah, no, that, that one was definitely like, you know, biggest takeaway. I think aside from that, 
we spent a lot of time talking about the layoffs and, you know, for me, it was, it was a little bit cathartic just being able to talk about it after being laid off. So that was, that was, um, I, I definitely enjoyed that and I needed that, but I liked the way. And, well, and, and for those, for, for, for our listeners, that wasn't the original plan and kudos to Jessica because, you know, I, it was all like really, really fresh and, you know, we were really just chatting about it what was going on with you, what was going on in the world. Cause I think the next day there was another round of layoffs. I can't even keep track with who's laying off who. I think it was Meta laying next, off. next week. Meta, or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I read this morning, Amazon's laying off, you know, 10, 11,000 employees, you know, in imminently. So, you know, this continues and we were, we were just kind of talking as we were getting ready to start the, the show, the recording and and Jessica put it out there. She was like, "Hey, look, I think we need to talk about this." And uh, and so you know, kudos to you for finding the courage to do it. I, I find that sharing things that are weighing on me to be extremely cathartic. And uh, I kind of take the take the power away from whatever that thing is um, that's preoccupying me by just like talking about it and putting out there. Yeah, no, for so, sure. Yeah, no, yeah, it definitely helps, and um, yeah, that that entire week was a roller coaster of emotions, and to end the week actually addressing it and talking about it, I think definitely helps. But um, yeah, what what we ended up talking about was, you know, she explained the domino effect that led up to all of the recent layoffs, and mm. you know, a lot of it's common sense, and I'm sure if I would have spent enough time actually thinking about it. I might have come to the same conclusion, maybe not, but I, I just feel like the way that she articulated it was so great. So she talks about how the domino directly before the layoffs was that companies were overhiring. So like everybody saw that companies everywhere were wanting to grow more, grow faster, hire more people, more headcount. Let's hire a hundred people this month, hundred people next month. That, you know, seems pretty obvious. The domino before that was that VCs were pressuring these companies to deploy more capital and grow as fast as possible. And I think anybody that works in the tech space has probably experienced this. You get an influx of of capital and immediately it's like, all right, well, how is your team going to deploy this capital and grow? And, you know, if you're on the marketing or the sales team, maybe the sales team, it's like, all right, we're going to hire, you know, 15 account executives and five SDRs this quarter, the marketing team, we're increasing your budget by, you know, 200% people team, which, which, which is crazy, report. which is crazy to me because yeah. I am yet to hear anyone say, Oh, Q3 of 2022, we, we crushed it from a sales and marketing perspective. We crushed it. It was the up for, you know, in, in uh, my experience has been, and everyone I've talked to has been the exact opposite. It was like a major slowdown in activity, but to your point, it's like ramping up of hiring literally to the day, the, the day up to, you know, firing, um, yeah. which is just just speaks to how frenzied kind of the uh, our labor you know the market I'll, I'll just I won't I won't even get specific it just speaks to how overheated the market has been which is crazy and and you're right I think th the domino layout is such a effective way of looking at it yeah yeah and not to go too much on a tangent here but last night I was playing basketball with a group of guys and you know, in between games, I was sitting there and the guy that was sitting next to me waiting for the next game just asked me like, hey, like, what's your story? Like, what, you know, what, what's your deal kind of thing? And we got to talking and I explained to him everything that happened the last couple of weeks. And he was like, wow, he's like, that's almost the identical story of, of what happened to me about eight months ago. And it was the same deal. His company was growing too fast, but they they had the foresight, um, I guess. Uh, to see that this was coming and they made the layoffs. He was like, you know, at least kudos to them for, for being able to see this eight months ago. Like they, they, they were pretty early with the layoffs. And um, I know regardless, like layoffs aren't great for any company, but I just thought that was interesting. So back. Well, I mean, you know, I, it, it's kind of, 
I'm, I feel like we're sounding somewhat like a broken record, but yeah. we it, it was literally predicted and laid out on this show. Ciara came on our show, the chief people officer of Dashlane, and she she was like, look, if you're not doing that, if your comp- company's out there, if you're not doing this, you should be doing this. And this is really, really serious. And that was months ago. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> some took action, some did not take action. And here we are. Yep. Here we are. So yeah, back to this this domino effect. I know we we got a little uh distracted there for a second, but yeah, no. So the the domino before you know you know VC is asking companies to deploy as much, deploy their capital faster and grow as fast as possible. It was that VCs were investing way too much money in overvalued businesses, and before that, obviously COVID disrupted the markets and changed everything. And you know, for the last, sorry, go on, Stephen. Well, I, I was just going to say, I mean, it's hard. There was just so much free, cheap money out there yeah, um, yeah. because of how much was being pumped into the to the global economy just so that because of COVID disrupting everything, disrupting our lives. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I can see that part I can, I can understand and I can see because it's like we, we, we all thought like everything is, is stopping and everything yeah. is changing forever and only to find out like oh it's not and yeah. um and so i think that the the covid situation like we we didn't even work we haven't even worked through that and all of these other dominoes these unexpected dominoes it's like you know when you're when you're playing the the domino game and i think there's like a a domino masters game now that i haven't watched yet that i want to watch but it's like you know there are these new branches of dominoes that were created by by covid and that we didn't even know about and those dominoes were falling before the reality of the events that the government took during covid kind of played out and so that to me i think was like it is the hardest like looking back mm-hmm. i think it's it's easy to see some of these things but i think the the real doozy for me was like covid and yeah. it's it's hard to see before that how we could have predicted or adjusted, but certainly at, at that point, we were in uncharted territory. Yeah. And that's something I think you actually asked Jessica, like, could any of this been avoided? And I think from there, we sort of segued into talking about how a big part of the reason that this happened, in her opinion, is that the VP of people or the chief people officer wasn't as involved in these these pre-planning discussions about growth and sort of being the voice of reason, like, Hey, maybe this isn't a good idea for us to hire a hundred people every month. And she she even talked about how, you know, before she was COO and she was, you know, VP people or um, I can't remember what her role before was maybe chief people officer, how, you know, she would have conversations with the, uh, one of the RVPs in the sales team or, you know, um, basically telling them like, I don't think that we have, we, we have product market fit yet to start hiring a bunch more sales guys yet. Like we need to wait and basically being told back off and how this happens all the time. But, you know, fast forward six, 12, 18 months when the layoffs are happening, nobody's coming back to the head of people or VP of people and saying, Hey, you were right. So I don't know. I, I think this, that's when we sort of transition into talking about how the chief people officer role, the CHRO role needs to be made more commercial and how historically companies have hired roles like the COO, CFO, and CTO first, and then a VP of people is hired. And this person usually sits outside of the leadership team and feeds into one of these leaders, whether it's the COO or the CFO. Um, and you know, her 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 thinking is that it's because VP of peoples haven't been great at marketing themselves as these commercial leaders. And it's been viewed, the people function has been viewed as this ephemeral cultural thing. When in reality, you know, they're responsible for the biggest investment of the company. And I think the the numbers she gave, you know, 60 to 70% of the company's operating expenses, when you're accounting for headcount, L and D offices, travel. And she thinks that we really need to elevate this role and CPOs need to take that commercial responsibility and understand this massive investment that they're responsible for, but also 
the 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 rest of they need to be invited in with the rest of the leadership team and the rest of the leadership team needs to give them that chance to take that responsibility i think for a growth company like a company that is the the plan and the intention all along is to grow to grow as quickly as as we possibly can to to capture a market whatever the end goal is the chief people officer, your CHRO, I believe is the most important hire and should be made as quickly as possibly, if not like, you know, within the first, you know, two to three hires, in my opinion. And I know that that may sound crazy to some people, <laughs> but given everything that we're talking about and everything we're learning about the the current market, what we've gone through and the the mistakes that that honestly are being repeated that are avoidable coupled with the fact you know the the, the generational shifts that are happening are are forcing the hand also for this employee experience to be more than just um you know kegs and ping pong um tables and and more than just a cool name to put on my resume that there's really this desire to have like meaning and value in, in my work and having that align with the company that I'm working for and what they do. I, I just feel like there are so many things that are changing now that if you want to be an effective growth organization, a growth company, your, your chief people officer has to be one of your first hires and you got to nail that, get it right. In my opinion. Yeah, I 100% agree. So do you want to talk about the the Jim Bartolomea episode? I yeah. know we're, we're running short we on should. time, so I want to no, keep us moving. We should. We should. Um, where do you want to start? Well, I I think there's a lot a lot of places we can start, but I think that, you know, going back to the segue, you know, my, the last comments I made just around the way that, um, that all these shifts are, are impacting people work. <laughs> the, the first thing that jumps out of me from, from the gym, the, the top takeaway from the gym conversation is using your values as a lens to essentially look through, evaluate all of your people, team, actions, goals, everything that the organization is doing um, and, and really using that, that lens of like, hey, does this really fit and align with our core values as a way of driving culture <laughs> the way yeah. that you want to? Yeah. And I think it, it's such a, again, right. such a simple, simple thing, but I, th I think now more than ever, companies are going to have to really take a hard look at their core values and mm -hmm. and align them with you know what what they're doing from a people perspective. Yeah. I feel like it's so easy to not forget about your core values, but you know, you get so caught up in the day-to-day -day of what you're doing because you have so much to do. Everybody has so much to do. There's always endless work for anybody, right? It's hard to lose sight of those core values and apply that lens to everything that you're doing, whether it's on the people team, the sales team, the, you know, um, product team, engineering team, whatever team you're on. And I, I think back this, this reminded me of the workify days whenever I was there at workify, you know, this must've been like four years ago. And mm -hmm. I remember we had a sales call that we were both on and I thought that you were a little went a little hard in the paint, and uh, <laughs> as I as I normally do. As and I, normally I do. remember after the call telling you like this that it doesn't align with our core value of be human. I think the situation was they wanted to see a demo right away, but with your sales hat on, they tell you in sales don't don't show the like you need to do discovery first. They need to answer all of your your questions and until you can identify pain there's an acronym called band right it's budget authority need and timeline need. and you yeah. were like we can't show a demo until we have band but i remember in that that situation thinking like but like could we like you know give them something and you were just completely shut it down and i remember saying like but does that align with our core values of or the core value of be human 
So I don't know why my mind went there immediately when he was talking about this. Um, but yeah, good times. No, I mean, I, I, I respect that. And I, I, I always, you know, I always, you know, my initial reaction being challenged like that is like, wait a second. But every time that an employee has challenged me, like, Hey, we're operating in a way that doesn't align with our core values. That has always been a a major, a major kind of pump the brakes and quickly reflect on what's happening here. And I, I there there aren't a lot of other gates that that will do that to me, right? And so and and there aren't a lot of metrics or measures that can have the aligning effect of, of core values. If, if done right, I still feel like a lot of companies aren't doing core values. They're not putting the time and energy that the values deserve. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and I think that for those organizations, it's, it's pretty obvious in the employee experience that, oh, these values, you know, they're not necessarily driving and dictating like what we do and the decisions we make they're just words on on <laughs> frames yeah. that were put on the wall and i i you know that feels cliche because i'm pretty sure you know i i spoke to values that way five years ago but to a certain extent i the, in some ways i don't think things have changed from the values when you think about everything we just talked about mm-hmm. grow 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 at the expense of everything even you know, rational thinking, (laughs) you know, we're still going to grow, grow, grow. Um, You know, I I guarantee you those companies were not, you know, we're not following Jim's suggestion, which is like, you really need to look through the lens of your values to to see if this is really the right thing for us to do. And and I'll, I'll do another callback to my work if I days, I don't know if I'm uh, it's been a while. So if I, if any of this is inaccurate, feel free to jump in. But I remember one way that we would reinforce our values is we would have, I don't know if it was a Slack channel or we would submit it through uh, the Workify survey platform, but every Friday Mm -hmm. we would do shout outs. And the way that um, the way that the shout outs had to be formatted, it was like, you know, shout out to Steven for, uh, for, the way that he hand he handled X customer and blah blah blah, and then you would have to list which core value they embodied, yeah. and I felt like it was a great way of reinforcing the values because every week we were talking about the core values, right? You know, if we yeah. had if everybody was doing a shout out, they had to look at the core values and like, okay, like I want to give you know Ahmad a shout out. Which core value did he embody this week? And then. Yeah, limitless. I, it, like you, everyone always knew like what which core value the kudos was was falling into. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. So we also talked about the employee experience, and I think the question that we asked Jim was, as a new chief people officer, um, like what are you excited to tackle first? And then I think we ended up talking about the employee experience and like how do you even get started? Like where do you where do you start first when you're thinking about the employee experience? And he used an analogy that made it really easy to understand. And he said, you need to think about building the employee experience like a house. And he's like, you know, first you need your plumbing and your foundation and all of the foundational stuff. And then you can build the walls and put up artwork. And I think what he said was, if you don't nail the plumbing and the foundation then, you know, you're going to lose people's trust right away. Like if you screw up somebody's onboarding and you don't get them into their benefits on time, you've already lost the trust of that employee. And uh, yeah, so now every time I think of the employee experience, I just picture a house and in that house, you know, every room or um, element of the house representing a different piece of the employee experience. Yeah. And, and how it all falls down if you don't have the the simplest things nailed down. Yeah, and oh, man, I I I so want to, you know, because you you're coming from an organization that had a really slick experience, yeah, you know, particularly on the onboarding piece. And you know, we we talked about. I remember for weeks, you know, you were talking about this onboarding piece, 
and how the approach just like really brought you into the organization well. And, you know, I, I feel like there's a question there, like what part of the house was, you know, you know, could have been different or maybe, you know, it was, uh, you know, like window dressing. I, I don't know, but I don't think we have time to talk about that today, but I'm going to earmark that. Yeah. Um, and so I, I couldn't agree with Jim more. I, I think that, you know, when you are talking, it, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And at the bottom, at, at the bottom tier, it, it's like you, you have your basic needs. And, you know, if those aren't being met, then it game over. You're, it's going to be very difficult for, for me as an employee to be engaged in my job if I, you know, I'm not getting a regular paycheck or I don't have, you know, I don't have a home, I don't have shelter, I don't have food, right? And, um, and obviously, you know, with, with what Jim was talking about, you know, that is like a next level up, right? Um, but it's still kind of the basic needs that you need from the employee experience to really start connecting with the culture. And I think there's an, an amazing diagram that could be built uh, to, to describe this. And I think increasingly companies, you know, the, the best companies are, are going to kind of not only build the house in a, in a really smart way, but they're going to explain to, to their employees, like which parts of the house are like fully, fully formed and which parts of the house are still, are still being enhanced and still being improved. Because the thing is, it's never, you know, you're never quite done. And, yeah. uh, and like Jessica said, like, you know, part of the, the benefit of taking a product management approach to, to, to your people function and to the employee experience, treating that as a, as a product is that it's always evolving and mm -hmm. there's always new requirements, new needs, new things that need to be done. So yeah, actually reflecting, looking back, these were two really good episodes to have back to back agreed uh, we, yeah. we we didn't plan it that way but it's just you know really cool reflecting and just in seeing how the how the similarities between jim and jessica's episodes and how what some of the things that they shared not knowing what the other was going to share actually kind of reinforced uh, both of their episodes yeah and then the last the last takeaway that i quickly wanted to touch on was that jim mentioned as the new SVP of, you know, global head of people in places that rather than coming in and acting right, right away and saying, here's my playbook. Instead, he went on a listening tour. He tried to understand the business as best as possible, get as much context as possible, see where there might be some, some gaps. And he's like, yeah, of course there's going to be low hanging fruit and I have a bias to action, but you know, it's more important to first just get a lay of the land and understand where everybody on the team is coming from because no company is going to be exactly the same as the previous company. And I think we heard this from Dilshan Bathnaika um, early on in The Modern People Leader. And I think what Dilshan said was the mistake that a lot of first-time chief people officers or VP of peoples make is they think that they need to roll out their playbook right away. He's like, but no, like instead you need to take your time, you need to go on a listening tour. And I'm sure a lot of the, you know, two or three time head of peoples out there listening have probably done it both ways. So yeah, just a good, a good reminder for, for all of the the people leaders out there, if you're about to, uh, to join a new company. Yeah. And, I think the way that feedback that that's the same feedback I got, you know, geez, 15, 16 years ago when I, when I started kind of my first position, managerial position that had any sort of kind of leadership responsibility was like for your first 90 days, listen, you should be listening more than you should be acting. And it feels super uncomfortable. It feels counterintuitive to me because I feel yeah. like it should be like action, action, action. And I need to prove my worth and I need to do all these things. But I feel like that feedback still holds today. And, and it was uh, it was it was refreshing to hear kind of Jim 
to your point, just say, you know, actually I, for the first 90 days, I'm just going to, I'm going on a road tour and I'm just hearing what people have, have to share. Like what is, what part, what, what part of their experience is working? What part is not, what is most important? Um, you know, what is, what is frustrating, you know, cause those are the things that, um, those are the conversations that are extremely powerful than in my experience, people don't forget that. People don't forget when a leader takes the time and is humble enough to just shut the fuck up and <laughs> listen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. All right. Well, should we should we talk man. about planning? Yeah. Let I mean we don't have a lot of a lot of time, but I think, you know, we I'm just gonna jump in because I think we can Go get get through this pretty quickly. And you know, the the fact of the matter is a lot of companies are in the midst of their 2023 planning. And for, for those of you that are still in the grind, we, we empathize with you. You know, I think this year, you know, more than any, any year is, has been particularly tough. And, um, and, and I, I don't think that it, for me, it's not a surprise that we're seeing so many, the, the timing of the layoff announcements, like all of that happening right now. Um, because I think, you know, some of this is probably coming out of the look forward to mm-hmm. the next year and a realization like, oh shit, th- these, this is upside down and, uh, and we've got to do something quick. Um, and so I know that there's business planning and the way that I've approached this in the past is for me, there's typically two or three like primary rocks and th- there's all sorts of different methodologies and approaches. And I, a lot of this varies by the size of the company, the size of the leadership team, you know, where your management team kind of grew up and learned how to, to execute on these sorts of things. But in my experience, it always, planning always involves looking at projections for the upcoming year, possibly to a broader, longer term strategy. So we've got a three-year plan to be the top widget maker in this particular market. So you're projecting out, you're comparing to like, where, where do we sit in, in this transformation plan or this strategic plan? And then agreeing as a leadership team, what are the, the high level goals? I, I call them rocks, like everything else can change, but these thing, these goals are, are going to be there and, and they're going to be what I call the rocks that we focus on regardless of how things play out. And so, and, and then from there, you start to cascade those down to, to your other departments, people, the people function being one of those departments. And then there's a process of creating your goals that then align with these kind of overarching business goals. Am I making, am I making sense? So no, far? that, that all makes sense. And, um, yeah, I've I've never been, <laughs> I've never been senior enough to be a part of those those conversations, but I've I've been a part of the the planning conversations once it makes it to my department and for me that's always been marketing. So um really curious to hear what that looks like for the for the people team. Yeah, and so for for the people team, you know, it's probably very similar uh to what you you've gone through in the people function, although you know, we there isn't a direct tie to revenue. Obviously, you know, we contribute to the the hiring, the execution of the plan to reach revenue goals. And, and to your point earlier, that typically involves hiring. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, um, you know, when, when you are, as a people team, when you're looking, you, you know, you will quickly know if you have a modern people leader in place or not. Just in my, in my, you know, belief just based on how they approach these goal conversations. You know, there are some leaders that will decide essentially what the goals are in isolation. And there are others that are, again, meeting with their team, listening to what their team is sharing with them in terms of like, what are some of the opportunities, what are some of the risks in terms of meeting the goals? Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I always, you know, was super frustrated with the processes where all of this was defined for me versus bringing me into the conversation. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) as you could imagine. And so, you know, for a people function, I think first, you know, what I'm about to walk through is uh, maybe common sense 
sense to some, but you would be surprised how many are just what seemingly is arbitrarily running what the goals are. But for me, I, I like to approach the people function similar to other groups. I think that, you know, you you should look at the the mission and vision for the company and for your particular team and look at like, okay, how are we holding up? Um, you know, we, we, we created this vision, this mission for our team. It aligns with the mission vision for the overall company. Are we supporting, you know, the company in the efforts or are we, are we failing? Um, I think you should reflect on your company's growth trajectory over the last year, considering particularly now, these are, these are some pretty tough conversations, Mm -hmm. um, you know, given everything that that's going on with layoffs and, and, and look at the upcoming years growth projections, which also may be pretty scary and uh, disconcerting. But, um, you know, looking at what success challenges and blockers you you may have, you know, what, you know, are the growth projections, you know, realistic, you know, and how how will you support those, you know, within each function of, of the team? And I, I, I take what's called a three, P, a three P's approach. Uh, so asking, you know, do we have the right people, products, and processes in place to to kind of support the plan, and that's what I call a top down approach. And and so I think for for all the uh, the people teams out there that are still kind of working through this process, you know, there there's a lot of uh, a lot of information that we can share just around, regarding a top down approach. But I, I I personally feel that you also need to take a bottoms up approach, and um, and. By that, I mean, you know, getting into the details of the function, which we definitely don't have time in two minutes or less. Yeah. I know we yeah. need to wrap this up. Yeah. And so the, the good news is there, there are playbooks. Like one of, you know, a couple of episodes ago, I shared like one of the, I guess, you know, one of the things about, you know, people HR space right now is how much sharing of thought leadership is happening. And so there are a lot of great tools and there's a lot of great playbooks out there you know even our for example shelby wopa she was i believe episode 45 and she's developed an amazing playbook for early stage companies um it's she calls it the the people team hiring guide and in that in this hiring guide she goes into a lot of the details of some of the very high level things that i just skimmed over but she drops in like really amazing insights. What are the different recruiting team models <clears throat> that you can take? What are some of the hiring productivity metrics that you can use as assumptions going into uh, your planning? And so just things that are priceless that, you yeah. know, these are the guarded secrets that that not a lot of people leaders are sharing out there. I, I love how she outlined it. So at the beginning, she, you know, uh, has like a bullet point list of what a people team's objective should be from there. She goes through each people team function from recruiting to people ops, to people experience, and again, list out bullet by bullet, what those teams should be responsible for. She then breaks down how many recruiters you should have at different stages of a startup. And I think she starts with under 25 employees and goes up to 500, 500 plus employees she talks through role definitions from VP of people to head of people to recruiting director. And, you know, the, the list goes on. Um, and, you know, I, I think I missed this. Not only does she talk about how many recruiters you should have, but like at different stages of the company, how you should be growing your people team. Like what are the yes. key hires at each stage? And uh, along with this people team hiring guide, there is a people team roadmap and capacity plan. That's a a Microsoft doc that she's created as a template. And in there, basically you can white label it. You can throw your logo on here and you can go through and all of the highlighted sections you just need to fill in for your company. And I think it's a great tool for, for people leaders and people teams out there that are going through this right now and starting to look, uh, look forward to 2023. So it's a great resource I believe she gave us she did give us a coupon code. So if you are interested in in checking it out, there's a 10% off discount code that's MPL10. And um we'll put a link in our show notes to the to the hiring guide. And yeah, there's a there's that code. We'll, we'll make sure that, that code's in there as well. And, and the, the reason I wanted to, to talk about this today, Daniel, is because of everything else we've talked about. <laughs> it, it it's 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 a difficult time right now. And 
you know, it can feel like you're on your own and it can feel, um, you know, it can feel, it can be hard to look at these things and, you know, for everyone out there, you, you're not alone. <laughs> there are people, you know, that are fighting the fight that are doing this difficult work with you and, and there there's help if you need it. So there, there sure is. Well, it looks like we're one minute over Steven, but, um, one minute over, I'm, I'm very impressed that we made it through all of, uh, what we plan to talk about. We, it was an aggressive, it was an <laughs> aggressive agenda for today, but yeah. we, we got through it. And yeah. so my, my, my one word close for today is hope. Okay. I like that. Mine, uh, mine will be 2023. Woo! Let's yeah. go. Hopefully, twenty twenty three doesn't bring as much chaos as uh twenty one and twenty two, but uh yeah, I'm hopeful. Don't 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 hold your breath, but I think there's reason to be optimistic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's hope. All so. right, great sesh. All right, man. Well, uh, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday, and um, I'm sure we'll catch up later today. We'll talk soon. All right, All right. bye, man. Bye.